And today we start with Sutta number 8.2.13. The Buddha said, Monks, a, th- a goodly thoroughbred steed belonging to a Raja, when possessed of eight points, is worthy of a Raja, is an acquisition to a Raja, is reckoned a Raja's asset. Of what eight? Monks, herein a Raja's goodly thoroughbred steed is of good breed on both sides. In whatever part other good horses are bred, there he is bred. When given his feet, green or dried, he eats it carefully without scattering it about. He feels abhorrence at lying or sitting in dung or urine. Pleasing is he and easy to live with. He does not cause other horses to stampede. Whatever are his vices, tricks, faults or wiles, he shows them to the driver as they really are, and his driver tries to correct them. When in harness he thinks, well, let other horses pull as they please, I'll pull this way. In going he goes the straight way. He is steadfast, showing steadfastness till life end in death. Monks, possessed of these eight points, a thoroughbred steed is worthy of a Raja, is an acquisition, is reckoned a Raja's asset. Even so, monks, possessed of eight points, a monk is worthy of offerings, the world's peerless feel for merit. Of what eight? Monks, herein a monk is virtuous, abiding restrained by the restraint of the Patimoka, perfect in conduct and resort, seeing danger in the smallest fault. He accepts the precepts and trains himself accordingly. When they give him food, mean or choice, he eats it carefully without a murmur. He feels abhorrence, he abhors misconduct in deed, word and thought. He abhors entertaining evil and unwholesome ideas. He, He is pleasing and easy to live with. He does not trouble the other monks. Whatever are his vices, tricks, faults or wiles, he shows them as they really are to the teacher or to some learned fellow monk in the holy life. And his teacher or fellow monk tries to correct them. As a learner he thinks, well, let other monks train as they please, I'll train in this way. In going he goes the straight way, and hearing and herein is that way, right view, right thought, right speech, uh, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Strenuous in endeavor, he abides, thinking, Willingly would I have skin and bones and sinews wither, flesh and blood dry up. Yet there shall be no seizing of energy till developed is that distinction which may be won by manly strength, manly energy, manly endeavor. Monks, possessed of these eight points, a monk is worthy of offerings, the world's peerless field for merit. That's the end of the sutta. It's another one of the suttas where the Buddha compares a good monk uh, to a good horse. Uh, these are the eight things uh, which make a monk worthy of offerings, uh, the world's peerless field for merit. Now, the first one, the monk is virtuous. is restrained by the restraint of the Patimoka. The Patimoka is the set of 227 precepts of the monk. Second one, when they give him food, he eats it uh, without any, without a murmur. That means without any complaint. And then he abhors misconduct in deed, word, and thought, and abhors uh, evil and unwholesome ideas. Mm-hmm. And number four, he's pleasing and easy to live with. Uh, number five. Whatever are his faults, eh, he shows them to the teacher so that they can be corrected. Number six, eh, he doesn't follow other monks. eh, He'll train eh, in the right way. Number seven, he goes the straight way. That means he goes according to the Aryan Eightfold Path. And then number eight, eh, he's very strenuous 
in his efforts uh, to live the holy life. Uh. And the next sutta is 8.2.14. Monks, I will define eight excitable horses and their eight vices, eight excitable men and their eight vices. Listen well, pay heed, I will speak. Monks, what are the eight excitable horses and their eight vices? Herein, monks, when an excitable horse is told to go on, being beaten and urged by the driver, he backs and twists the carriage round with his hind quarters. Such indeed herein is an excitable horse, and this is his first vice. Told to go on, being beaten and urged by the driver, he jumps back, batters against the carriage railing and breaks the triple bar. This is his second vice. He loses his hind quarters from the pole and tramples on it. This is his third vice. He takes the wrong road and makes the carriage go awry. That means go wrongly. This is his fourth vice. He tosses high his breast and pours the air. This is his fifth vice. Heedless of the driver and the goat, he champs the bit with his teeth and wanders at random. At random. This is his sixth vice. When urged by the driver, he goes neither on nor back, but halts and stands like a post. This is his seventh vice. Moreover, monks, when an excitable horse is told to go on, being beaten and urged by the driver, he draws together his fore and hind legs and just sits down there on his four feet. Such indeed is an excitable horse, and this is his eighth vice. Monks, these are the eight excitable horses and the eight vices. And what monks are the eight excitable men and the eight vices? Herein, monks, the monks reprove one of themselves for some offense, and he, being thus reproved, evades the matter by a plea of forgetfulness, saying, I don't remember, I don't remember. Just as an excitable horse, when beaten and urged by his driver, backs and twists the carriage round. Like that, I say, is this person. Such indeed, herein, is an excitable man, and this is his first vice. Or, on being reproved, he blurts out at his reprover, What right have you to talk, an ignorant fool? Why do you think you must speak? Monks, just as an excitable horse jumps back and batters the carriage railing, like that, I say, is this person. This is his second vice. Or he retorts, Well, you too committed such and such an offense. You had best make amends first. Monks, just as an excitable horse loses his hind quarter from the pole, like that I say is this person. This is his third vice. Or he evades the question by another, turns the issue aside, and shows temper, ill will, and sulkiness. Monks, just as an excitable horse takes the wrong road and makes the carriage go awry, like that I say is this person. This is his fourth vice. Or he speaks when the Sangha is in private meeting with much gesticulation. Monks, just as an excitable horse tosses high his breast and pours the air, like that I say is this person. This is his fifth vice. Or he pays no attention to the Sangha, nor heeds his reprover, but wanders about at random like an offender. Monks, just like an excitable horse is heedless of the driver and the goat and champs his bit, like that I say is this person, this is his sixth vice. Or he says, but I've not committed an offense, no, I've not offended. And he vexes the Sangha by his silence. Monks, just as an excitable horse when urged goes neither on nor back, but just halts and stands like a post. Like that, I say, is this person. This is his seventh vice. Moreover, monks, when the monks reprove one of themselves for some offense, he being thus reproved by them, says, Reverend sirs, you worry so much about me. From now on, I will disavow the training and return to the lower life. And when he has returned to the lower life, he says, Now, Reverend sirs, be satisfied. 
Monks, this is an excitable horse, and told to go on, being beaten and urged by the driver, draws his fore and hind legs together and sits down. Like that, I say, is this person. Such indeed, herein, is an excitable man, and this is his eighth vice. Monks, these are the eight excitable men, and these are the eight vices. That's the end of the sutta. Just now we heard the comparison of a good monk eh, with a good horse. Now we hear the comparison of an excitable horse eh, and an excitable monk. This excitable monk means uh, his mind is very uh, excitable, a scatterbrained monk. And this type, this type of monk uh, is no joy to live with. So during the Buddha's time, there were many, many types of monks just as we have now. So the Buddha has a lot of experience with them. That's why he can mention all these types of monks. Eh? And the next sutta is 8.2.15, the Buddha said, Monks, there are these eight stains. What eight? Monks, non-repeating is the mantra stain. Not rising is the stain of houses. Sluggishness is the stain of beauty. Carelessness is the stain of a god. Misconduct is the stain of a woman. Stint or restriction or limitation is the stain in giving. Evil and unwholesome states are stains in this world and the next. But there is a greater stain than these. Ignorance is the greater stain. Monks, these are the eight stains. It's the end of the sutta. So in this sutta we find uh, the different uh, blemishes uh, or stains uh, of different things. Uh, but the greatest stain uh, or blemish in the world is ignorance. Because of ignorance we do a lot of unwholesome evil deeds uh, and cause the suffering of ourselves and of others. Uh, therefore, because of that, uh, ignorance is the greatest stain. The next sutta is 8.2.17. Monks, a woman enslaves a man in eight ways. What eight? A woman enslaves a man by appearance, by laughter, by speech, by song, by tears, by attire or dress, eh? by garlands from the forest and by touch. Monks, in these eight ways a woman enslaves a man, and beings caught by these are verily caught as though in a snare. And the next sutta is similar to this, but the converse, eh? 8.2.18. Monks, a man enslaves a woman in eight ways. What eight? A man enslaves a woman by appearance, by laughter, by speech, by song, by tears, by attire or dress, eh? by garlands from the forest and by touch. Monks, in these eight ways a man enslaves a woman, and beings caught by these are verily caught as though in a snare. It's the end of the sutta. So these two suttas eh, are a bit similar to the first sutta, the first two suttas we heard nah, in the Anguttara Nikaya series nah, where the Buddha said nah, that there is no form that enslaves a man so much as the form of a woman. No sound, no smell, no taste, no touch nah, that enslaves a man nah, so much as the form, uh, sound, smell, taste and touch of a woman and conversely the, the verse is also true. La. There is no uh, form, uh, sound, smell, taste and touch that enslaves a woman so much uh, as the form, the sound, the smell, the taste and touch of a man. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, the, the opposite sex uh, is a great obstacle to the spiritual path. La. And these are the different ways uh, in which uh, uh, this um, attraction of the opposite sex uh, uh, um, uh, attracts uh, a person that is by appearance, by laughter, by speech, in other words, by sound, by song, 
by tears, by attire, by garlands, and by touch. And the next sutta is quite an important and interesting sutta. 8.2.19 On one occasion, the exalted one was dwelling near Varanja at the foot of N- Naleru's Nimba tree. There, Paharada, the Asura king, came and visited the exalted one, saluted him and stood at one side. So standing, the exalted one addressed him thus, I imagine, Paharada, that the Asuras find delight in the mighty ocean. I'll just stop here for a moment. Eh? These Asuras eh, are devas, heavenly beings, eh? and they used to reside in the uh, Tabatimsa heaven, the heaven of the 33 where Sakadeva Raja resides. Lah. But it seems that uh, Sakadeva Raja uh, threw the Asuras out of the heaven, uh, down into the ocean. Uh, one day when the asuras were drunk, because the asuras, they like to drink and they like to fight. And uh, so one day then they were quite drunk, uh, the devas, uh, the uh, Sakadeva Raja and his other devas threw these asuras down into the ocean and it seems that they reside there. But once a year, once a celestial year, they'll go up to the Tabatimsa heaven and fight with Sakadeva Raja and the other uh, devas. Lah. Paharada is one of the Asura kings. There are several Asura kings. Another one, another name that is uh, often mentioned is Vepachiti. Another one is Rahu. Rahu is supposed to be one of the biggest devas. So the uh, Paharada, the Asura king, answered, Yes, Lord, they find pleasure therein. Then the Buddha said, But Paharada, how many wondrous marvels are there which the Asuras delight to see and see? Lord, there are eight, uh, there are these eight wondrous marvels. What eight? Lord, the mighty ocean slopes away gradually, falls away gradually, shells away gradually, with no abruptness like a precipice. Lord, that the mighty ocean slopes away gradually, falls away gradually, shelves away gradually, with no abruptness like a precipice. This is the first wondrous marvel, which the Asuras delight to see and see. Lord, the ocean is fixed. It does not overrun its bounds. This is the second marvel. Lord, the ocean does not consort with a dead body, a corpse. Whatsoever a dead body there be in the ocean, it will quickly just force ashore and pile up on the land. This is the third marvel. Lord, all the great rivers, the Ganga, the Yamuna, the Achiravati, the Sarabhu, and the Mahi, on reaching the mighty ocean, lose their former names and identities, and are reckoned simply as the ocean. This is the fourth marvel. Lord, though all the streams in the world flow into the ocean and the rains that fall from the sky, yet by then neither the emptiness nor the fullness of the ocean is affected. This is the fifth marvel. Lord, the mighty ocean has one taste, the taste of salt. This is the sixth marvel. Lord, the mighty ocean has many and diverse treasures. There is the pearl, the crystal, the lapis lazuli, the shell, quartz, coral, silver, gold, ruby, cat's eye, etc. This is the seventh marvel. Lord, the mighty ocean is the home of vast beings. There are the fabulous fishy monsters, the timis, the timingalas, and the timi timingalas. There are the Asuras, the Nagas, and the Gandavas. There are in the mighty ocean creatures a hundred leagues long, two hundred, three, four, and five hundred leagues long. Lord, that the mighty ocean is the abode of vast beings, Timis, Timingalas, Timi, Timingalas, Asuras, Nagas, Gandavas, and creatures leagues long. This is the eighth wondrous marvel, which Asuras delight to see and see. These, Lord, are the eight wondrous marvels. I suppose, Lord, the monks find delight in this Dhamma. Yes, Paharada, they do. 
But Lord, how many wondrous marvels are there in this Dhamma Vinaya, which the monks delight to see and see. I'll just stop here for a moment. Dhamma Vinaya is the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, in the suttas, uh, the discourses of the Buddha, the Buddha always called his teachings the Dhamma Vinaya. And in the Anguttara Nikaya 4.180, the Buddha said Dhamma refers to the suttas. Uh, that means the suttas and the Vinaya books uh, are the complete teachings of the Buddha. And the, the word Tipitaka or Tripitaka was only um, coined later. It was not a word that was used by the Buddha. Then the Buddha continued, There are eight Paharada. What eight? Paharada, just as the mighty ocean slopes away gradually, falls away gradually, shelves away gradually, with no abruptness like a precipice. Even so, in this Dhamma Vinaya, there is a graduated training, a graduated practice, a graduated mode of progress, with no abruptness, such as a penetration of knowledge. That in this Dhamma Vinaya, there is a graduated training, a graduated practice, a graduated mode of progress with no abruptness such as a penetration of, no of knowledge. This is the first wondrous marvel in this Dhamma Vinaya which the monks delight to see and see. Paharada, just as the ocean is fixed and does not overpass its bounds, even so, when the code of training is made known by me to my disciples, they will not transgress it even for life's sake. This is the second marvel. Paharada, just as the ocean does not consort with a dead body, a corpse, but will quickly just force it ashore and pile it on the land. Even so, whosoever is wicked, of evil nature, unclean, of suspicious conduct, full of secret actions, no recluse, though vowed thereto, unchaste, though vowed to chastity, rotten to the core, lustful and vile, not with him will the Sangha consort, but quickly assembling, it will cast him forth. Though he be seated in the midst of the assembled monks, yet is he far from the Sangha, and the Sangha is far from him. This is the third marvel. Paharada, just as the great rivers, the Ganga, the Yamuna, the Achiravati, the Sarabhu and the Mahi, entering the mighty ocean, lose their former names and identities, and are termed simply ocean. Even so, these four castes, the Katiyas, the Brahmins, the Vesas and Sudas, going forth from the world into the homeless life, into the Dhamma Vinaya proclaimed by the Tathagata, lose their former names and lineages, and are reckoned simply recluses, sons of the Sakyan. This is the fourth marvel. Paharada, this is all the streams that flow into the ocean, all the rains that fall from the sky, affect neither the emptiness nor the fullness of the ocean. Even so, though many monks become completely cool in the cool element to which nothing attaches, yet neither the emptiness nor the fullness of that cool element is affected. This is the fifth marvel. Paharada, just as the ocean has but one taste, the taste of salt, even so, this Dhamma Vinaya has but one flavor, the flavor of liberation. This is the sixth marvel. Paharada, just as the ocean has many and diverse treasures, the pearl, the crystal and so forth, even so, this Dhamma Vinaya has many and diverse treasures, that is to say, the four intense states of mindfulness, Satipatthana, the four right efforts, Samapadana, the four bases of psychic power or four bases of success, eh? Idipada, the five faculties, Indriya, the five powers, Bala, the seven factors of enlightenment, Bojanga, and the Aryan Eightfold Path. This is the seventh marvel. Paharada, just as the mighty ocean is the home of vast beings, the Timi, the Timingala, and so forth, even so, this Dhamma Vinaya is the home of great beings, that is to say, the stream winner, 
And he who has entered the path to the realization of the fruit of the stream winner, the one's returner, and he who has entered the path to the realization of the fruit thereof, the non-returner, and he who has entered the path to the realization of the fruit thereof, the arahan, and he who has entered the path to arahanship, Paharada, that this Dhamma Vinaya is the home of great beings, the stream winner and so forth. This is the eighth wondrous marvel, which the monks delight to see and see. Verily, Paharada, these are the eight wondrous marvels, which the monks delight to see and see. That's the end of the sutta. It's one of those quite delightful suttas to hear. Uh, this as the... There are eight uh, wonderful qualities about the ocean. So the Buddha says there are eight wonderful qualities about the teachings, the Dhamma Vinaya. The first one uh, is that the Dham- in the Dhamma Vinaya, there is a gradual training, a gradual practice, a gradual mode of progress. And here the Buddha says, with no abruptness such as a penetration of knowledge, Uh, This is uh, about the only place uh, that is quite clear here that the Buddha says uh, there is no abruptness uh, uh, such as a penetration of knowledge. No abruptness. Na ayatakena. Penetration of knowledge is anya pativedo. So this translation is quite accurate. That means you practice the holy path, eh, the, the, the spiritual path. Eh. You don't expect eh, to suddenly have a attainment of knowledge. It's a very gradual process. Eh. Uh, and so that's why we should not uh, be too um, too eager to get results. Eh. Uh, it takes time. Eh. Uh, we, we need to just put the effort in the spiritual path uh, and the slowly uh, we will attain the um, insights uh, in time to come very gradually. Uh, uh, there is no abruptness of uh, attainment of knowledge. Uh, and then the second one, uh, the Buddha said uh, that his disciples will not transgress uh, his uh, code of training, the precepts, etc., uh, uh, even for life's sake. Uh, and the third one, uh, the Sangha will not consort with a wicked, uh, evil monk, uh, but they will throw him out of the Sangha's, uh, um, out of the, out of the Sangha. Uh, they will meet and throw him out if they, they will expel him, uh, if they know that he's a false, insincere monk. And then the fourth one, uh, just as there are four, uh, just, just as all the great rivers uh, enter the ocean and lose their former names. Uh, so in India at that time there were four castes. Uh, the Katyas are the warrior castes. Uh, the Brahmins are the priest castes. The Vesas are the merchants. Uh, and the Sudas are the labor uh, castes. Uh. But when they go forth uh, and become a monk, uh, they lose all their castes. Uh. They are just called... Uh, Samanas, recluses, sons of the Sakya, Sakya Putta. Uh, but even though they lose their cars, some of them are, they are still called by their names uh, and their surnames. Uh. For example, Kasapa. Kasapa is a surname. Moglana is also a surname. Uh, but sometimes they have their, um, uh, personal names, like, for example, Sariputta. Sariputta means the son of Sari. So, uh, the fifth, um, wonderful quality about the Dhamma Vinaya is that, um, though many monks become completely cool, uh, that yet the emptiness or the fullness of Nibbana is not affected because Nibbana is, is not a place it is a state uh, that is beyond time and beyond space. Uh, it is not in this world. That is why the emptiness or fullness of Nibbana is not affected by the number of monks who enter Nibbana. The sixth quality uh, is that the teachings of the Buddha, the Dhamma Vinaya, has only one flavor, the flavor of liberation from suffering. Uh, and that is the purpose of the spiritual path, la to attain liberation from suffering.
And the seven quality is uh, just as the ocean has many treasures. Uh, so the Buddha says uh, in the Dhamma Vinaya there are these uh, various treasures, uh, which actually are the thirty-seven Bodhipakya Dhammas, the requisites of enlightenment. Uh, the four Satipatthana, the four Samapadana, the four Idipada, five Indriya, five Bala, seven Bojanga, and the Noble Eightfold Path. Then um, the eighth one, uh, just as the ocean is the home of many beings, so uh, the Dhamma Vinaya is the home of uh, uh, great beings uh, who are the Aryans, Aryans, uh, those, uh, the stream winner and the one who has entered the path to stream winning, uh, the one's returner and one who has entered the path to uh, one's returning, etc. Actually, in this translation, we note uh, that um, the translation reads like this, the, the original translation in the book, uh, the stream winner and he who attains to the realization of the fruit of stream winner, uh, this, when I check the Pali, yeah, I feel is wrong. Uh, because according to their translation, uh, it means that the stream winner is a path attainer. Uh, but actually, the, to my interpretation, the stream winner is the fruit, uh, the fruit attainer. The Pali is Sotapano, Sotapati, Pala Satchitiriyaya, Patipano. Uh, Patipano, one who is an entered on the path, Pala Sachikiriyaya, uh, attainment or realization of the fruit of stream entry. So one who has entered the path for the realization of the fruit of stream entry, and that is the path attainer, not the fruit attainer. So the sotapanna must be the fruit attainer. Uh, these are the... Uh, so each of these terms, uh, sotapanna, sakadagamin, anagamin, and arahan, they refer to the fruit attainer. Uh, and uh, you note here there are eight individuals, not four individuals. Uh, the Aryans are always described as eight not four. And in other suttas, uh, we will see that the path attainer and the fruit attainer, they are different persons. It's not that um, one moment he attains the path and the next moment he attains the fruit. It's not like that in the suttas. Uh. They, 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 after attaining the path, uh, it may take years before they attain the fruit. Uh. So these are the all the eight wonderful qualities uh, of the Dhamma Vinaya.